without further ado, let's get to why we're all here tonight, Alicia Garza's book. So Jamel, kick us off with question number one. Sure, and I'm gonna put the specific question, I'll put the specific questions in the chat as well. So um, the, the book is really about movements and discussing movements and how they come together and why. And we thought it would be good, a, a good opening question is to ask you all, have you ever felt that you were part of a movement? And what was it? And why did you actually feel that you were part of it? And then the second part of the question is, have you ever felt that you were part of, of a movement that ultimately was not what you thought it was? Um, so talking about our personal experiences with whether or not we felt we were in a movement, in or out of it, and, and why. And um, I'm going to, uh, I'll be like Wes, and I'm going to be silent uh, and let, let people jump in on this. You can, um, you can use the chat feature. Uh, or raise your hand and we'll unmute you. I'll go if nobody else wants to. Go for it. I kind of felt like Team Pete was a, a movement of, for me because I never got involved in politics before he started running for, for office and belonging being one of his rules of the road. I, I really felt that with some of his volunteers, the way we, we accepted each other. I don't know if I've been part of one that wasn't what I thought it was because I'm not really a joiner. So I, I couldn't say that I've joined that many. And, and Tracy, what was it that made you feel like, what was it that was different about the time that you the, that you actually chose to join what you felt was a movement. I liked his message. I, I liked you, the the values he was espousing, and it just attracted some very positive people to his campaign. I, I'd been in a, when I was younger in a couple of campaigns where if you weren't part of the party machine, you didn't get to do anything, and they were very good at including everyone, no matter how new you were to the the process and all kinds of volunteer efforts and making you part of what the, 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 the campaign was all about. That's just me. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? I see, um, oh, Clarissa, let's, uh, I'll ask you to unmute there. Okay, hello. Um, I'm new to this group or um, something like this. And to answer your question, um, I am born and raised in South Texas, and I lived most of my adult life, 20 years, um, in the New York City area. And I recently moved back to South Texas, my hometown. And um, as soon as I moved here, that's when um, 2020 Trump um, came in. Um, I was there for the debate for Hillary and Trump. And then I came to this state, and I didn't, I wasn't thinking about how much um, my rights were going to be taken away from me, just moving from one state to another state. Um, and then it it really occurred to me how much of an impact it had. And I had just gotten here and I was thinking, oh man, my whole family's here. So it's not like I'm just going to leave or anything, but um, I had to figure out a way to like get through it. And so thank God Beth O'Rourke, uh, you know, was around here in the state. And um you know, I follow politics uh, throughout. Um, I was in live broadcasting, so I had to keep up with some things, but it really was hitting me personally and family. I was seeing being destroyed by, um, you know, a lot of things that were happening under the Trump administration. And so when Beto came in, um, O'Rourke, that just became a, a game changer for me um, in this state and including my family, they were all Republicans before Trump. and. Now they're all Democrats because, well, we all see <laughs> what's happened and what's happening. Um, so I don't know if that's, I'm, get, I'm thinking that's a movement, right? The better work, like flipping the state um, and doing a lot, whole lot of other things. So I'm just really grateful to be a part of it and talking to people about it and learning about other people's opinions without getting into arguments. And um, just 
trying to get through it as best we can, especially down here. I mean, of course, everywhere, but you know, that, that's, that's all. So you're talking about somebody who speaks to you and, and the things that you're thinking and then also creates an environment in which you actually feel like you do belong. Yeah, I think For sure. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Robin. Um, I, I feel like this is a movement, um, but in the wake of the summer of um, 2020, um, I feel like there was actually a movement amongst white people um, with a very fervent desire to want to learn things that um, for various personal reasons, different people, um, just facts about our history, um, thoughts and ideas about uh, equality and social justice within our country. There were just a lot of things that people just didn't know. And it felt like there was this flood in 2020 of people all of a sudden wanting to know information. And so I feel like there were a lot of us who are people of color who kind of had to be willing to step up and and that's probably not the right word to use because there are very valid reasons why some people of color chose not to uh, be ones to contribute emotional labor to that kind of blood because in some regards it was like drinking from a fire hose. Um, a lot of people online, a lot of people um, personally in my life just all of a sudden wanted to know these informa this information. Um, they wanted to know ideas. They wanted to learn about experiences of people of color. And it could get overwhelming at times. I actually ended up putting together like documents to say like, okay, here's like a basic learning guide of like, if there are things that you don't understand, here's how you can learn about gentrification. Here's how you can learn about discrimination in the medical field, kind of creating like a springboard to help people kind of figure out where they needed to go to learn those, um, those kind of like core ideas. I feel like that movement is still going. It's, it's lost a little bit of steam in that it was kind of rapid fire but in, when it first happened. But in some regards, that's kind of a good thing because, you know, it, it needs to be something that's sustainable and ongoing and long-term. And I feel like this book club is one of those things that will help it be um, sustainable and, and long-term because this is a space where we can continue that kind of work in a, a meaningful forum and in a way that that will less like be less likely to burn people out. Because I feel like in, in the wake of 2020, a lot of people of color have burned out by that flood. That's that's great, Robin. And I I kind of agree that I think the book club and and, uh, and people finding ways to connect virtually. Uh, post, you know, through COVID and post COVID. I don't know how it's coming together, but I do feel something. I feel moved by, I don't join tons of things. I've never been in a book club before. So I feel something. Uh, I'm going to get the, I'm going to post the documents again. Um, uh, Cause you know, so people who joined a little bit later, I'm going to push this in the chat. Um, other thoughts before we, uh, any anybody else you want to share about being part of a movement? I, I think a couple of people, um, uh, the, the you know, would be, um, a couple of people mentioned uh, Keith Ellison, you know, who I, I do think of as somebody who seems to be leading uh, a movement or at different points, I thought he was, but uh, anybody else? And, and Wes, do you want to respond to Peg's? Uh, Peg's question in the chat. 
Um, so the second part of the question. Have you ever felt that you were part of a movement that ultimately was not what you thought it was? Oh, I, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, <laughs> essentially, long story short, but um, walked into a situation and the authorizers of the charter school um, uh, decided they were going to close us down. And uh, it was uh, a very undemocratic process. Um, there was a, a huge lack of trust between them, the school community, including staff and parents. Um, and so I want to like sit down and be quiet. And so I just stood up and started barking and, you know, and everyone's like, keep going and let's do this. And we just organized and ultimately they won. They had the power, but that started something. And uh, not only like from a work perspective and a political organizing, but also building a community and even though I don't live in Minnesota, and that's been now six years ago, um, I'm still very close to a lot of those people, and we are all very politically active. And, um, and so that moment, um, I think, turned into a movement for me, but then also, um, yeah, uh, I think it also um, has a... Uh, it's allowed us to want to be involved um, in our spaces outside of just that school. So, yeah, I could talk to you all about charter schools and that whole thing a whole nother day, but that's another story. So, Any other thoughts? All right, well, I'm going to pass it over um, Wes or Robin. Uh, I, I think Robin, were you going to take the next one? All right, and I'm going to put that in the oh. chat. Sure, I can take uh, the next one. Um, do you think we should combine two and three, maybe just for the sake of time? Sure, I'll put both in there. Okay. And uh, for those, a couple of people have just joined, so we're just we're. You know, we're going through some of our questions. Uh, feel free to jump in, you know, in, in response, use the chat or raise your hand. All righty, next two questions. <laughs> what are some of the norms, customs, and practices that have shaped the movements within our current political climate? And how do we support movements for which we do not have cultural context? What are some ways to understand without impeding and what are some ways that we may have partial context and how does that affect how you engage? So if anyone wants to tackle any one of those. money that you listed in here let's move past the past if that's something you want to expound on feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you there to share your ideas around that i see crystal has her hand up so i'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute hi everyone um i guess i'll just tackle the first part of that question um what has shaped movements uh, within our current political climate. I think it is actions that many people see as being inhumane, um, as unbearable, as um, complete and utter mistreatment, um, as not having a voice. Uh, and so I think when people see themselves um, in some of those situations, then movements begin to happen. Then people begin to unite regardless of what they may have disagreed on before. Um, they find common ground with that. Uh, and I'll just take, um, uh, give two examples, of course, the, the, um, 
the killing of George Floyd was one. And I think that changed many people's perception of what could and has happened within this country um, racially. And I think many people, and, and I've spoke to many people who would say, well, you know, there's no racism in, in the United States or it's it's not as bad as it was before. And I would just go, you, you, you really don't read anything. You really don't, you aren't paying attention. You aren't paying attention to what's happening. Um, so I think people watching that in that time frame when they gave the minutes um, that he was on the ground, I think was a galvanizing point for many individuals. Um, and so that brought up a certain emotion in individuals. Um, I also think uh, another example, of, of course, recently is with the Supreme Court um, just decimating Roe versus Wade um, is another thing that um, galvanized individuals and those who thought this would never happen could became, you know, like, what, what do you mean not in my lifetime? Could this ever happen? So again, that emotional um, type of connection, I think is what galvanizes a type of movement and has shifted our political climate um, and and I'll just stop there. Thank you for sharing, Crystal. Rita, you have your hand up, so I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Um, I was interested in how much she talked about um, how Ronald Reagan had set the stage for all of the strange platform that the Republicans wanted to have. And I didn't really realize how much of his platform was there at the time. And when I read through this, this is exactly what the Republicans are doing today. But, um, and they might even be doing something like Reagan did, which is covering up what they're really doing. They never talk about their platform today. They never really say what they're going to do. I mean, they do, but not, they're not, running for office on it. And um, I think it had, I mean, like it also talks about what he did was he was opposed to the Voting Rights Act in 1965, which is when I was in high school. He was opposed to the Fair Housing Act of 1968. He gutted the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and fought for extensions of the Voting Rights Act, vetoed the Civil Rights Restoration Act and opposed the creation of Martin Luther King Day. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And he was doing this in the, well, in the 60s, it started before then, but they were still doing it. But it seems like the party itself is just stuck there. They haven't, I mean, when I was reading this, I was like, this isn't Ronald Reagan. This is the Republican Party today. That was kind of shocking for me to see how long it's been around and hasn't changed a bit. Yeah, Wes and I were actually talking about that a few days ago, how, you know, when you read a lot about what happened during the Reagan era, how it almost fits perfectly right on top of what we're seeing now in uh, the Trump administration. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Rita. Uh, yeah. Kara, you have your hand up, so I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay. Sorry, I'm I'm a mess. So I'm not my uh, my visual on right now. Um, freaking Reagan. I, I. Oh my God. I lived through that. Um. And I was a young adult. I lived in, well, I'm in California, um, and I lived in actually in Hollywood at that time. And it was like almost overnight, there were just all these people all of a sudden on the streets that were just wandering, you know, just aimlessly 
obviously had been released from some, you know, psych psychiatric care or some kind of care center or, you know, social support systems that had just been absolutely yanked out from under them. It was, it, it was, it was overnight. It was, I can't tell you the damage that that guy did. I can't even begin to, yeah. Anyway, yeah, it was visual where I was. It was in your face. Thank you, Kara, for sharing. Uh, Marsha, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute. Okay, I guess the, you know, the thing that sort of stood out for me on the Reagan thing, it was there was discussion and articles on his deregulation and sort of the more economic issues, not, but that, you know, it created sort of the income you know, inequality and therefore sort of created the sort of the resentment, you know, the, you know, discontent, people feeling like they're, they've been left behind that then, you know, Trump could take advantage of. So it, you know, um, while you're correct that he also, you know, had restrictions on um, and was sort of doing things on the civil rights front that uh, his economic issues really did create that sort of ground spell of inequality because it, you know, it was the deregulation the, that led to sort of deregulations of certain of the banking requirements that again, created more inequality and then the tax breaks and stuff, it was just like one thing after another, but that, that you know, and then also the fact that he, many of the social welfare programs like HUD and some of those other things, the funding was sort of devastated so that it, um, and also even federal funding for education, therefore people, you know, had more difficulty going to college or the debts and stuff. So it just, you know, that, that groundswell of sort of discontent where people, um, I mean, they're, you know, that they're sort of being falsely um, led by the, you know, the, the Trump sites, you know, and somehow they're going to help them because they're not going to help them, but that they have that underlying discontent and mistrust of the government that, you know, and feeling um, left out that um, he was able to take it, that Trump was able to take advantage of. Yeah, that is a, a great point, um, Marcia, and actually touches on one of our um, other questions as well. So hopefully we'll be circling back around to some of those ideas as well in a little bit. Uh, Lynn, you have your hand up, so we'll ask you to unmute and then I see another person there, so we'll get you after that. Uh, I think Lynn is still muted. Yeah, it, uh, maybe you can try it, Jamal. I, I have, I got it now. There we go. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, um, Sometimes I think I was in high school too with Reagan, and so uh, now with all this Trump stuff, I I think about. It seemed to me that in the interim, from Reagan to Trump, there were times when things got better. Obama and um, Carter and some people that really were. And I don't, I guess I was thinking about this the other day and I was discouraged that how did we get, how did we get back to here? Because I felt like, I guess, pretty Reagan that we were making some headway. It's just a little disturbing. And how do we prevent, if we get this squared off, how do we prevent the same thing from happening again? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lynn, for sharing. Um, I think I saw someone else have their hand up. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Let's see, I'm gonna try it as well. The person with the iPhone. Yeah. Uh, Find your unmute button.
Hello? Yes, now we can hear you. Great. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm Grace Mishler. Um I I've been reading like John Bradamus's book on educational for all. Um, he was a minority leader for here in the state of Indiana uh, with the U.S. Congress, and then later uh, president of New York University. And in his book, he he referred to uh, that how how um, uh, Reagan wanted to gut and just totally remove the Department of Education. And I think that's interesting because uh, right now the whole educational thing is. Uh, being gutted by, you know, like people like DeSantis uh, from um, Florida. So it's interesting. There is a uh, sense of parallel of Reaganites today. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind sharing the name of that book in chat, we would appreciate that. We can add it to the uh, I may have a problem. Uh, Marcia, could you do that for me, please? I have low vision. Oh, gotcha. But uh, Marcia Shows could help me on that. Thank you. And it's called Educational for All by John Bradamus. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for sharing. All right, Wes Jamel, are we ready to move to the next next question? Yeah, yeah we'll post, post that and uh, turn it over to Wes. Okay. Um, I also just want to highlight in the chat, um, Alonzo did share a, a response to question three um, that speaks to, uh, and I'm trying to find the question, um, how do we support movements for which we don't have a cultural context? What are ways to understand without impeding? What are some ways that we have may have partial context and how does that affect how we engage and Alonzo responded, uh, we can educate ourselves with the other cultures. Um, we can ask, how can we help? Um, and then partial context hurts our ability to truly be effective. I added the word truly, but I, I really like what um, Alonzo put there. And so I wanted to highlight that so everyone saw that. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing, Alonzo. Um, all right, um, so question four, um, what happened between us is half yours and half mine? And um, I believe that's a quote from Alicia's, um, somewhere in her experience, I forget the individual who said that, but um, if we looked at situations of um, half as yours and half as mine, um, and so, how would stories of what happened changed if we acknowledged what happened is half yourself and half theirs? Um, so, and then to kind of go with that, do press, progressives hold some responsibility for our current political situation? And if so, what does that look like? And how, and this is the big part, if so, how do we address those problem areas? So what happens between us is half your, between us is half yours and half mine. How would the story of what happened change if you acknowledge that what happened is half yours and half theirs? Well, I'll speak up uh, to hopefully get the discussion rolling a little bit because I think um, some people kind of touched around um, some of the ideas. And this is when we talked about a little bit ago to us about how the left embraced dog whistle politics and how, how that kind of stirred tensions amongst the progressive base, amongst the left and inhibits our ability to effectively collaborate. And Lynn, I see you have your hand up, so I'm going to ask you to unmute. You've got a, you're still muted, Lynn. Oh. 
Lynn, you should have a button that pops up on your screen that allows you to unmute yourself. So if you just go ahead and hit that. That one works, thanks. The one on my um, iPad screen doesn't want to unmute, but that did, thanks. Now what I would, I forget what I was going to ask. Uh, Uh, so we were, oh, we were about talking the, about, uh, yeah. It's, yeah, yours and mine, or it, it's half yours and half mine. And um, I was just going to ask somebody to apply that specifically to the situation so that I could get a better idea of how you do make it work. So, a specific, you know. How about who could be a tough one on the Supreme Court now? How do those people communicate? Even? Yeah. Um, Kara has a good response. I think that also answers some of your question of an example. Um, she says, we were asleep and working on our careers with too much tunnel vision. No one could even imagine things moving backwards the way they did. I forget who spoke about it a minute ago about how you know we had forward momentum after the civil rights movement and then things seem to go backwards um, as a racial uh, effect um, and in the years after Obama. So Alonzo, I see you have your hand up, so I will ask you to unmute. Greetings, everyone. I just had some thoughts on the reason why I'm been involved lately is because of what happened with George Floyd here in Minnesota. I live in St. Paul, the sister town of Minneapolis, and I've been here for four generations. My family came from Andrew Jackson's plantation, the Hermitage, and it's been here in Minnesota since 1870. So this, this um, discussion tonight is very important to me. And I think it's more about compromising more than anything that we need to compromise and come together for the betterment of our country. If we can just stop pointing the fingers at each other and just realize, like you said, I need to deal with mine and the other person needs to deal with theirs. But we can come together and we can compromise to make this country a better place because we all are one race. This is all of our country and I'm part of, proud of being American. And I'm proud to be able to speak and not have to hide my voice anymore. And I think I might've got off topic, but I just feel like my real life, my real life situation speaks to this country, to the problem that we have now. It comes from, comes from the first settlers, the first settlers. So we just have to know where we came from and come together and, and turn this country around. And that's what I have to say on that. I'm gonna go on mute. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Alonzo. Appreciate it. Um, Alexander, I saw your hand raised. Did you want to say something? You can put in the chat, or if you raise your hand again, we'll get your mic turned on. All right, Rita. Um, I'm just concerned because about 10 years ago, I belong, um, I noticed that churches were more um, open to civil rights and were more open to of uh, sex education and abortion. They weren't banning it. They weren't even talking about it. It wasn't even on their mind. 
And all of a sudden, a group came along that decided that Christians should be the voice for banning all abortions. And it took over congregations everywhere and changed everything. And because it's, it's such a large group, it cha completely changed the culture. But on top of that, I was more concerned about the media, like Rush Limbaugh and those right-wing voices that just made people think that they weren't human beings if they didn't follow this doctrine. Mm. Yeah. And I've noticed the Democrats are trying to overcome that deficiency in the media, but their Democrats are really struggling to get the voices that the Republicans have in everywhere. Mm. And right now it doesn't even matter who's in charge. I mean, like, Russia can come in or QAnon can come in and just have a voice everywhere because of the media. And yeah. Well, and I feel like you're speaking to that kind of that first question um, with norms, what influences our movements, you know, and, and I, I said in the chat, social media and technology, and, you know, it's very, um, movements can spread quickly because of technology and media and whatnot. So, yeah. Anything else you wanted to respond to in terms of our question? No, I just wanted to say that about I'm concerned because it doesn't seem like if we don't figure out how to control the media more and be a louder voice, we're going to have this problem again and again and again. It's going to repeat itself because Republicans are determined, like I've never seen before, to take over the country. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and Shannon um, mentions in the chat that um, the quote comes from uh, Roman numeral XIII, which I believe is page 13. Um, and so, uh, and I believe that is in the, that is in the, uh, the foreword, correct? Or is that so there's in another place. So in the, the question, that timestamp is also the audio book. It's okay. Yeah, the introduction. Okay, introduction. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and you know, and Rita, as you were talking, something that um spoke to me is um we gotta stand up and be a louder voice. And I and I think um as Rob and I were kind of talking over this question earlier this week. That's a big thing we talked about is, you know, as a as pro progressives and part of the progressive movement is, you know, um, and Alonzo, I I when you were speaking, what I heard was, you know, we have to we have to admit the truth of where did this country all begin, and and we have to come to uh, be willing to just say it and stand on that truth. And then ultimately, because of that truth, what are we going to do? You know, provide that action. Um, but I do think a big part of it is just speaking up um, and taking that responsibility. Um, and so there's a lot of other chats. Of, oh, um, Jocelyn asks, Robin, can you give an example of what you meant when you said that progressives are engaging in dog whistle politics too? Um, so do you want to kind of elaborate on that? Sure. Um, we actually went into this um, in some detail as well with our um, previous book, um, Merge Left with uh, Dr. Ian Haney Lopez um, and uh, Alicia Garza will touch on it a little bit more in this book as well um, for week two. But even the way that progressives talk about racial equality, um, can at times, depending on the group that they're referring to, uh, white saviorism kind of bleeds into a lot of the ways that uh, progressives and others on the left talk about social and political ideology. Um, I feel that personally, the left infantilizes um, racial minorities quite a bit. Um, we fetishize other cultures a lot. And even if the 
intention is to be helpful, um, a lot of the actions end up being more so that progressives will attempt to provide a solution for a group that they think is best for that group based on their perspective, as opposed to engaging that group and finding out what that particular group feels that they need. And also the fact that in our country, we don't spend enough time learning even about our modern history and the impacts of racial policies. You know, one of the biggest and easiest things to understand is about how the through line from redlining to gentrification. And a lot of times because people don't understand how those things connect, we make policies around housing, we make policies around zoning without really understanding where situations come from. And so we talk to communities without that knowledge. And so we're missing a huge part of the picture and we make, we fill in the gaps that we didn't take the time to truly understand and know. And in doing so, we end up not giving a full bodied solution to what they actually need. And at the same time, we end up just further perpetuating inequality because we leave certain people in positions of power to be making decisions when we should be letting communities make decisions for themselves. I hope that answers your question, Charles. Thank you, Robin. And, um, you know, and we, this question kind of got written in, um, you know, and in chapter, in chapter two, you know, um, it's, it's brought up of the work, you know, Bill Clinton and his presidency and kind of continuing to use the dog whistle terms that President Reagan and conservatives came up with. Um, and, you know, those, those got repeated. Um, and so, you know, we have to be very careful as progressives that we are not repeating language um, that is used by um, the other side and other individuals that truly is um, racist and truly does not promote our message. And so I think that goes back to, again, our thing to do is we got to promote our values and our message and continue to repeat it over and over and over again to counter the other alternative. Um, and so, uh, and you'll also hear, you'll hear the other media. I mean, let's just face it, we're facing it here in um, our local community of, this this two side thing when it comes to hate and I saw someone put it in the chat like there's literally a politician in Nebraska running for state media and literally was a person was wearing a shirt that had Hitler on it and at the, <gasps> of the shirt it called it, it essentially equated Joe President Biden to Adolf Hitler and everyone there was taking pictures with this person and promoting it and that's a problem. But when it was pushed out on media, they gave a both sides perspective. And it's like, there is no two sides to this. That is anti-Semitism <laughs> um, at the very basic. And so, yeah, so I mean, like we, you know, we have those issues. And so as progressives, let's make sure that we're not um, perpetuating that and we're standing on our values and our truth. So, any other thoughts in just terms of, you know, like, um, you know, maybe you have a personal experience, even as working as part of a movement where, you know, you, you took that half is mine and half is theirs approach to move forward uh, with a fellow person you're working with or anything, but. All right, go ahead, Clarissa. Um, I don't know if this is um, like what you're referring to, but um, like 
for here especially, I mean, I know across the United States, but especially here, the AR-15s, the guns. Um, so when Sandy Hook occurred, I was living in the Northeast and uh, my daughter was in kindergarten and that was the, well, Sandy Hook was all the kindergartners. And then I moved here with my daughter, I'm a single mom, and um, then Uvalde happens. And then I just don't understand why there aren't any red flag laws. And also I don't understand why there aren't any, um, I don't know the word, but I don't know if it's stipulations or um, like for the, um, the overturning Roe versus Wade um, for incest and rape. And this state holds a lot of those and Governor Abbott is saying that, um, that the abortion, um, removing it uh, from our rights is gonna make this state the safest state to be in, which I just don't understand. I just can't, there's just, I don't, I just don't understand anything about that at all. And, um, and then I don't understand too, how some of even the people I used to hang out with, even family members, there are still for them, you know? And I just, uh, I'm sorry, I lost track because I just can't, it's really um, disturbing to say the least. And uh, so that's why I'm glad I'm here in the state now to try and fight back in a, you know, the good faith wise, um, because that's extreme. And I never, and like what someone had said earlier, um, I was taught like Roe versus Wade when I was in junior high and high school. And I never thought those were things you thought would never, like they said earlier in this conversation, would ever come back in our lifetime. And the fact that it's happening in our lifetimes, um, you know, however old, you know, um, they were when it actually happened when we were like kids to now we have kids and it's happening to them. It's just, um, well, that's what, that's what helped me push forward and speak because I used to be quiet because um, I was afraid of like people, you know, saying things to me and maybe I wasn't educated enough to say something back or I didn't know how to say it, um, which is another reason why I'm a part of this group so I can learn from you all and be educated as well. So I kind of lost track, sorry, but that's, that's where, yeah. Well, I appreciate you uh, being willing to take that step and to speak up and to stand on stand on your truth and uh, to advocate to what you uh, um, what we uh, know is important. And so that that's the first step is you said, you know, I'm I'm stepping up, I'm speaking out, but then also in that process, you're also learning, and I think that's a big thing, you know, with our with. Um, what we can do is that, you know, as we go into movements and as we are part of movements as grassroots organizers, there might be times where we do mess up or there might be spaces where we don't know everything. And so getting that full context, getting that full understanding and having that one, that desire to take action, but then also that desire to learn and grow um, is essential um, as organizers. And so appreciate that, Clarissa. Thank you. All right, I think uh, we are probably good to move on to the next question. And Jamel, I believe it's your turn to lead this discussion. Okay, uh, great discussion, everybody. So uh, I got the impression that um, uh, uh, the author, Alicia Garza, you know, was talking about what she felt were tactical successes of the movement on the right. And so we wanted to ask you all, do you think the movement on the right has been successful? And if so, why do you, you, know, why do you think that's been successful? Any thoughts on that, uh, folks? Uh, Rita, you've got your hand up. Uh, we'll go with you first, and then we'll go with Lynn. I'm going to ask you to unmute, Rita. Um, I think they've been very successful because they've brainwashed a whole generation of people to believe that their values shouldn't be what they really are, that they should be 
what their party says that they are. And right now we're at a point where it doesn't matter what their own personal values are. They're just voting Republican because they're believing whatever the Republicans tell them. Um, and it's everywhere. It's in schools, it's on the media, it's on the street, it's in churches. People are just voting because they're Republican. They're not, you know, I can remember years where I was thinking, why are people voting against their own values when they vote for these people? They don't get the property values and the things that they need for their own lives. They kept voting against their own issues, their own things that they needed. And they just voted for Republicans because they were labeled Republican. So, I mean, I don't know how much more successful you could be than convincing half the United States that they should just be Republicans because that's what it, that's what's important in life, not what you need for your own family. Okay, thanks, Rita. And I don't know if it's half the United States. I mean, it's 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 got half the voting, but I'm not sure that it's half the United States. Um, well, and in some like, cases, it's not even half half yeah. the voting because because yeah. of the way. Things are district, right? The way things well, are districts, we, right. we concentrate progressive voters so that their votes count. Their votes become diluted. Yeah, and, and I th so I think that that's that's it's part of the tactic. Um, uh, Lynn, I'm going to ask you to un. Uh, yeah, I just feel like. We are being, we're supposed to be assertive about what's ours. And I feel like, often I feel like listening to other people, cause I don't speak up a whole lot either. In, you know, just any group, they, the progressives of which I am one sound really not very humble they they aggravate the other side I, i'm you know i i also have my two of my best friends i've been in richmond virginia for 25 years and two of my best friends got sucked into this and i just can't believe how they did you know they're both um Republicans, but not really outspoken during the years that I've known them. And now they won't, they barely speak to me. And I, it's, it's about that. It's just like, I, those are serious things that we have to resolve, you know, between just people that you, I think you mentioned something about families, people in your families. And we have, I have that situation going on too. So we got to work those things out before any big picture is going to change. You can't even talk to each other. Can't listen anyway. That's a that's a yeah. Can't listen. That's a, a really good distinction. Uh, Kara, I'm going to ask you to un. Hey, I don't even remember what the original question was, but I think. Uh, do you think the do you, do you think the movement on the right has been successful? And if so, why? Oh, right. But you, but you don't have. You can just say what's on your mind too. No, I won't riff. I just had a short comment about that. Um, I'm still floored to keep hearing and reading about the decades-long planning that's been going on in you know in this interior small group tea party whatever you want to call it you know christian right to get there to get this this journey accomplished i mean for decades it's been thoughtfully planned out it, it, the minutia and how that works is is just staggering to me and i can't explain it but it's it's a full blown strategy and, and that, that they stuck to for decades and decades. And 
damn it, it's worked. And I just can't believe it. So that's all. And I think it to, to me, I, what's been disappointing is that it's a strategy to win at all cost. And I oh, think yeah. this is yeah, this is a huge disappointment in our party system right now that uh, it, it's win at all cost um, uh, to a certain extent on both sides. But uh, Kara, the other Kara, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say to Lynn, you're absolutely right. As far as um, the people just like you can no longer have conversations with them. I'm in Indiana. I don't talk to any of my family anymore. I have a very small group of people that I can hang around with. And I'm not going to lie. I'm almost 50 and all of my friends are Gen Z because all of the people, the white people, I know my who are my age are not, they are not um, like even rational anymore. They're just everything, they're hate, so much hate. Every, they're just all so full of hate. And um, yeah, and the racism and the homophobia and the, it's just crazy and I cannot, you can't even deal with them. You can't even talk to them. Can't have a civil conversation without them bringing up something completely irrelevant to the conversation, but they just have to get their jabs in. So, and about the, the right being um, successful, they have been 100,000% successful. Their campaign campaign has been has filled this country full of small-minded, hate-filled people. And it is sad and it is ugly. But if you, if you read, if you listen to anything from Fox News or Rush Limbaugh, they are the dog whistles. Like there's a book called Mediocre by an author who I can't pronounce. I can put it in the chat though. That's an incredible book about how the people in the United States, we can't have nice things because people, white people don't want black people to have anything good. So like the unions don't work here because when unions are trying to form then the organizers, they pit black people against white people and our social safety net, like all the other countries have, white people don't want black people to have nice things. And that's hard to hear for white people, but it is the absolute truth. So it's something that white people need to understand so that we can call it out, so that we can focus on it and fix it. Thank you. Thanks, Kara. Um, I see Crystal's hand up. And then I also, oh, before we go to Crystal, I'm going to ask, um, I think, I can't remember your name, but you've got a baseball cap on. I'm going to ask you to unmute because I saw your hand go up there. Uh, so I've asked you to unmute there. Um, try again. You raise your you raise your physical hand. And, and I, I've asked you to unmute there. Uh, all right. Well, we'll go. We'll go to Crystal, and then we'll try to get back. We'll try. We'll try to get back to you there, uh, Crystal. I'll ask you to unmute. I. Uh, I just. Um was floored by some of the information that Carl was talking about. I think the right has been successful and, and I know people feel as if they have been 100% successful. Um, I think they have been successful in creating that division by using that type of rhetoric, um, by closing or finding, the, finding ways to close themselves off, whether that is 
talking over you so that they do not hear your opinion or physically turning their bodies away from you so that you cannot address them physically um, or getting in your face um, and shouting um, to you about their perspective of the politics. Because of that, they have created this division and they are somewhat succeeding in alienating um, people, um, but they are also creating alienation between, alienate, alienating those individuals who are on the fence about voting and who to vote for. And so those are the ones that we need to grab and say, listen to this line of reasoning. And this is why you need to vote for this resolution, for this particular candidate. If you listen to what this candidate is saying, if you look at what's happening in our community. So the, the, they have been successful in alienating those individuals from us in being able to have civil conversations with them and sit down and say, this is what we really need to talk about because if we can get those group of individuals to understand what is happening and how their voice really does make a difference, because I believe for many of those individuals, they're beginning to feel because of all of the hate that they are listening to, all of the misinformation that they are getting, they're just kind of like, well, it doesn't matter. My vote doesn't matter. It's going to be this way anyway. And those are the ones that we have to really take a strong effort in trying to grab them and say, no, tune out the noise. This is what we need to focus on. So we have to find a way to shut that noise down so that those individuals can actually hear the truth and what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, that was that was that was going from a negative to you're trying to turn it into a positive, you know, which um, which I really like. And um, and, and I, I guess would, go ahead. Sorry, I would like to add to um, to Crystal's point. Um, I think that what you were talking about also touches on question three and how some of this is half on us as progressives because instead of engaging those communities who didn't want to vote it's it's starting to happen now we're starting to get to that point now but instead of engaging those communities who didn't feel like their voice mattered we spent a lot of time ostracizing them or kind of shaming them for not voting instead of listening to the reasons why they made that choice yeah tracy go ahead i think part of it's what robin was saying the other part is the republicans have always been at least since reagan very disciplined they vote every time for every office no matter who's running if as long as the republican they get their vote whether they like them or not we're not the same way we have to motivate people to vote we have to find some way to come close to what they do in lockstep it's almost like a machine and um that that's they 50 years ago they wanted to get rid of Roe versus Wade. They had the patience, they had the discipline, and they got what they wanted. That was their whole approach. One election at a time. Yeah. So I see we've got 15 minutes left. I'm gonna put um questions seven, eight, and nine up uh, at the same time uh on the you know, in, in the chat and uh, Robin, did you want to take uh, jump us around through those a little bit? Pick pick what you pick what you want there, because uh, trying trying to combine some things. Oh yeah. Um, so just given the time crunch, 
I will go with um, seven and nine. Um, why do you think the author spent the first two chapters providing a history of her observations and influencing growing up, including an emphasis on pop culture? And this is a question directly from Alicia herself that was in the book itself. How do we make new mistakes and learn new lessons rather than repeat the same mistakes and be disillusioned? I feel like a lot of the things that we're talking about have touched on some of these points. So if we can bring those together and really focus on those, um, I think uh, to answer some of those questions because a lot of people have been touching on it already. So Tracy, you've got your hand up. So I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute. I just forgot to put it down. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll do that no now. No worries. So Kara, we'll go ahead and ask you to unmute. Um, I think that she included the pop culture stuff because the our education system in this country is not great. And so a lot of times we learn about things through like, how many people didn't know about the uh, Tulsa massacre until they watched The Watchmen? Was it Tulsa, Oklahoma? Shit. I yeah, it was. You know, yes. what I'm, mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about. And, um, and stuff like that, like pop culture, Pop culture is where we learn a lot of things because we are not learning a lot of things in our school. So I think that she threw, she used that as an example because it was how she learned also. That's a great point, excellent point, Kara, thank you. Anyone want to, and Peg has a great quote here, history will repeat itself. If we, are, if we don't learn history, we're doomed to, uh, to repeat it. And just kind of going back to what we were talking about before, the Reagan era feels like it repeated itself with the Trump era because there were so many things that we didn't learn lessons from. And Jamel, you have your hand up? Yeah, real quick, um, Grace, I, I see you're trying to raise your hand. You should be able to, uh, if you can find the mic button, you can turn your mic on. I try to change it. Okay, I got it now. Yay, Hello? good. Yeah, I, there was some things that was happening on my, um, yes, uh, what I want, I was thinking as I was listening to everyone, uh, I was in Vietnam for quite a uh, quite a few years, and I I just have to laugh, you know the the we hear that oh the Democrats are socialist communists you know like type of thing, and it when in reality they're they're acting like the way the the one party system uh, is in in uh, um, and they'll they they will cheat to. Uh, Make sure that uh, it stays that way, um, and I I think it's just ironic because um, uh, you know like really it's it's kind of a capitalist mentality uh, in in Vietnam uh, they they're they're against capitalism but at the same time the people who are in government and get elected through a one party system are very capitalistic. And they're uh, and and so uh, it's just interesting to watch the movement that's going on in Vietnam. How it, it reminds me a little bit what goes around here in the United States, if that makes sense. It's ironic. I, I think it, it does. It does make sense. But uh, but it's well, we don't know what. It, you're making sense it doesn't make sense but you're making sense <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and the, the thing is they're they're intrigued with a uh, uh, putin and i you know i would imagine some of them are are not for the whole ukraine issues that they will side in with putin um i, I was just i was just going to uh, say a couple of things you know one um i mean the, the the 
so much of this does depend on education, people actually reading, taking the time to discuss and, and actually think for themselves and challenge ideas. I, I do think that that's absolutely necessary. And one of the ways in which the right has succeeded is you essentially convincing people not to do that. Um, just you know, take keeping keeping very simple, uh, you know, uh, two dimensional you know, d d discussions. You're either you either vote this way or you don't vote this way. There's no there's no gray area or anything like that. Just uh, dumbing things down, keeping it very simple is a way in which they uh, there there's been some appeal there. And I and I and I'm not just I'm not saying that both parties don't do that sometimes for the purpose of selling their ideas. Um, and then the other thing that I was going to add, because a couple of people have talked about uh, the difficulty of talking to family members or people in their community, and some of those folks I think are I, I haven't recognized before as participating in book club, but uh, Wes will probably talk about this in a little bit some of the other things that building bridges has yeah, are really great programs in terms of helping you talk through issues with other people who might think a little who might think differently from you and um, that's part of education as well uh, you know learning what's at issue and then also learning how to talk to each other too Yes. Um, oh, go ahead, Shannon. I'm trying to unmute here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, okay. I changed the settings. Uh, I was responding to uh, question number eight that popped up there. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas, and that's where Bill Clinton is from. And so I have a personal relationship with Bill Clinton and with Hillary, not real close friendship, but friendly acquaintance. And uh, I was struck by, we've talked about this before, and you were just saying how different our perceptions are based on our experiences and how that makes it hard for us to talk to one another. And I was struck by that, how my impression of the Clintons was how good they were for the state and how good they were for education and the economy and so forth. And yet I realized that the author had a very different experience. And yet they probably both are true that people are complex and really you know, nobody is all good or all bad. But uh, I, I think that ties into what you're talking about with how to have conversations across that and how important as Peg was pointing out it is not just to talk to people, but to listen to people and to talk with. So that was it. Thank you, Shannon. Um, and, you know, and, um, experiences matter and you know and uh uh our experiences are ours but someone else's experience is theirs and so i think yeah like you said taking time to listen in those situations and to learn and um and recognize that hey i can experience something but someone else can experience something totally different um and so appreciate that um there are great comments going in the chat tonight. Um, our team, and Robin really does this, Robin tries to um, encompass the discussion into the chat and to a follow-up. Um, and so uh, do know that we see that and things that, you know, like books that people have shared, we'll put that in. Um, I will highly encourage, go read the other books we've read. Whether it's the doc, talking about dog, dog whistling, that's in Merge Left. Talking about the history of our country and recognizing that, that history, um, the sum of us. And then also the sum of us um, speaks to how, how do we deal with this? Um, and, uh, and then just going into other books, um, you know, there, we've, read, we've read, just a personal little shout out. We read some pretty damn good books here. So I think you all should read them if you haven't before. But we're so thankful you all are here tonight. And so, um, yes, where can we see the recordings? Um, 
Okay. Hold one second. And you know what? We'll have I, the, the, record, the link to the recording is in the follow-up guide that we send out through email. So you yes. have that link as well. Robin, could you find our YouTube channel? Yep. And then put that in there. And then also put a link to um, our just our web. Hold on. I will find the web page. You all are asking great questions, and I appreciate that. One thing I noticed is we had a discussion with Professor Edie Haney Lopez, and I have not put that video on our YouTube channel. So I got some work I got to do. Um, but let me get the link to our book club. Here's the link to our website that has all our books. So I'm going to put that in there. Shannon and Rita, I'm going to hold off real quick. I'm going to go through um, just our wrap up and then you can turn your mics on and ask some follow up questions. So let me share my screen here. Um, so next week we are doing chapters four through seven. Um, and some two quotes that we kind of pulled from that is winning is about more than being right. It is also about how you invite others to be part of change they may not have even realized they needed. So that's why it's important to talk to people. Um, don't, don't waste your time talking to the people who aren't going to listen and spew hate. Don't waste the time. You don't need to. You need to protect yourself. But there are so many people out there who don't even realize that they need to hear certain things. So be afraid to speak up and talk. And then building a movement requires shifting people from spectators to strategists, from procrastinators to protagonists. And so, um, you know, we're talking here about this book, and ultimately we hope this makes you speak out, get involved in your local areas, and take action, and join movements that are happening within your communities.